best I can do is sit with this and allow it to continue to emerge. I don't know where this is going or how it's going to resolve and, and just to get okay with that not knowing, you know. Uh, I, can yeah. do th I can do this today, okay, and that's all I have to do. I can do it right now. And uh, I just never forget, I was riding along one day and the tears of sadness turned to tears of gratitude. And I started coming out of it, whatever it was. Yeah. And so, and, and even having this, you know, stable sense of, of connectivity for all these years doesn't in any way negate the fact that life goes on and it's difficult. Brack Jeffries is a man who has accumulated acronyms. I'm just going to read them off to you here. He's a PhD, LPC, CCS, LCAS, RN, and LMBT. I'm a little tongue-tied after that, but I think all of those acronyms reflect his deep interest in the human spirit and in the healing spirit. He describes himself as a transpersonally oriented, body-centered therapist who has been incredibly interested in exploring the depths and heights of the human condition, both personally and professionally, for over 30 years. And that'll make more sense after you listen to our conversation. But just to give you a sense of this man's presence, he's of very large stature. He's well over six feet tall. Just a huge man. But he is also quite warm and disarming and within just a few minutes of being with him I just felt at ease and really enjoyed talking to him. We discovered pretty early on we're from the same area, eastern North Carolina, and we hit it off. I'd heard of Brack from my experience in holotropic breath work at one of Stanislav Grof's conferences. And he's one of the most experienced practitioners of this discipline around. And we talk about holotropic breath work and spiritual healing in general. And I hope you enjoy our conversation. This is Brack Jeffries. Yeah, uh, I've shared my story with people in the, in the 12 step community is that's, that's sort of part of the deal. And I've had very personal conversations with people I work with over the years, but I've, I don't know that I've ever had this particular kind of interview. So I'm curious and you know, a little anxious and, and mostly interested in seeing where this goes, you know? Cool. Well, that, I mean, that's natural yeah. and that's how it should be, I think. So, you know, I had heard about, about you before I met you. In fact, well, when I went to the, the conference in Taos. Yeah, with Diana. Yeah, with yeah, Diana. She's a, she's a beauty. Yes, yeah, she is. I enjoyed meeting her. You've probably known her a while. Yeah, she's, she's a real deal. But she was like, you got to look up Brack you know, when you come back here. Hmm. And so it had been on my things to do list for a while. Okay. And also, uh, Corey Costanza. Yeah, Corey, yeah, has a float tank. Yep, yeah. he was just here a week ago. Yeah. In that seat, and uh, I enjoyed talking to him. I just got done. With that one. Yeah. Nice guy. He commented on the Brooklyn Bridge over there. Uh-huh. Yeah, because he's from Brooklyn. Uh-huh. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Raleigh. Um, really? I'm yeah. from Raleigh. Yeah, I grew up in Raleigh out uh, between Nightdale, Clayton, and Garner. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, my parents are from Johnson County. Really? Meadow. Okay. Um, kind of near Smithfield. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I grew up more to... I went to Garner schools. Yeah. And uh, I... Um, I think my mom's family is from uh, down in Johnson and Harnett County. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> okay, what part? Coates. Coates, oh, yeah, near Bowie's Creek. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes, yeah, so I, I grew up there. I lived there uh, up until I was about, uh, until I came up, moved up here to, to Western North Carolina, which was in 1984, and I've been up here most of that time. Yeah, so you went to Garner High School? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. It was a football powerhouse when I was coming up. Yeah, I wasn't too much in touch with that. I was doing other things. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sports wasn't my ideal. Yeah, well, I bet you probably had to say no as opposed to like people just neglected me. But, you know, you, you're formidable size here. Right. So that you probably got recruited for basketball and all they, that. They always wanted me to play basketball. Yep. I have two problems. I, I'm, I'm not that good at it. I can't jump and I have no peripheral vision. <laughs> Other than that, I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. So you grew up in Garner. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Were your parents together? Yeah, they're still together. My dad just wrote a, a book about their 60 year relationship called Keeping It Together. Cool. It, just, it just went on. Uh, they just put it on Kindle, and it's, uh, it's about their 60 year relationship. Wow. Pretty interesting. Have you read it? Yes, I have. It's uh, uh it's an incredible book. I learned some things about my parents uh, uh, that were I suspected about them, you know, uh -huh. uh, learned some things I didn't know. And uh, oh, cool. it confirmed that, you know, they've had this really incredibly deep love relationship for 60 years. And uh, the opening scene or the opening story in the book is one of the most tasteful yet, I mean, really hot love scenes I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you might want to get my dad in this chair because he's <laughs> he's well, for this part of the yeah, story. Yeah, he's, that he's, must have been tough to read. It was great to read. I mean, yeah. it, it was great to read. Uh, we've had a pretty good relationship. It's developed over the years, and uh, uh, yeah, it was it was fun to read. It's interesting to see his perspective on things and just what was what worked for him. You know. Uh huh. So he's the Eastern North Carolina native. Too. Yeah, I grew up in Raleigh. Garner is a political consultant. Raleigh, he grew up in Raleigh, so he's a, one of the first political consultants and the first writer, one of the first writers for the two first TV stations in North Carolina, in Charlotte and Raleigh. What was it, WREL? WREL and yeah. whatever the one in Charlotte was when it opened up. Yeah, okay. So, uh, interesting. He just turned 81 Sunday. So. <laughs> wow, all right, yeah. yeah. Did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I have a uh, younger brother and sister. We're about a year apart. My brother's a year younger. My sister's two years younger. And I have an older stepsister from my mom's first marriage. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. she's about seven or eight years older than, than I am. Uh-huh. Okay. So what was it like growing up? Well, you know, uh, growing up, we lived out on out in the country. Uh, we had like a, about a 12-acre place out in the country. And horses, that kind of stuff growing up. Spent a lot of time out in the woods just hanging out and playing and you know, we'd leave the house in the morning and not come back till dark. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could do that back then, I guess, and it wasn't yeah. considered strange. Right. Uh, so we, it was pretty fun. We had, we had, uh, you know, we had some struggles in our family, but um, for the most part, they were, I don't think anything too unusual. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, did a lot of the normal things, uh, Cub Scouts, you know, camping. My dad and mom were into boating a lot, and so uh, I don't know the rivers. And then uh, later on, uh, we, we spent a lot of time in New Bern during the summer and going to the beach. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting, kind of fun. New Bern's a pretty place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my dad was in, like I say, he was in public relations and advertising, but he always kept a small working kind of, I wouldn't say it was quite a farm, but he was always, you know, had a few acres of something growing. And so, uh -huh. uh, you know, I never really took to it, uh, although I certainly spent some time doing it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Y'all had horses? Horses, cows, that kind of stuff. Yeah? Did yeah. you have to milk the cows? No, they were beef cows. Okay. So we raised them and ate them. Yeah. <laughs> that's how they used to do it back that, then that's how we did it yeah know? both my parents grew up on farms in johnson county uh -huh. and uh, my dad would always tell me he would tell me you know you're deprived for not growing up on a farm i'm like i didn't have a choice in this <laughs> you chose to live in the city right <laughs> it's blaming me yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but you know being out in nature is i mean we always valued it you know we'd ride our bikes and mm -hmm. Get down in the creek and catch salamanders and all of it, you know. It certainly makes for a good growing up, I think, a wholesome childhood. Mm -hmm. I think it's important. Good memories. Yeah. Good memories of being out in the woods and just doing stuff that was, uh, 
I, I guess kids do that, still do that stuff. It seems like uh, maybe it's uh, uh, not as available in some places because of the growth and the population. But uh, yeah. I'm sure it's still going on a lot of places. Yeah, I certainly hope so. Yeah. yeah. It's a tough world. A lot of noise out there. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. yeah. So what was, did you do well in school? Or? I did well in school until I didn't do well in school. Uh-huh. And uh, I was uh, in the academically gifted curriculum until uh, I got into high school. And I, you know, I, I got interested in drugs very early and uh, had a, uh, that's part of the story, you know. And, sure. uh, you know, that took me out of a lot of things pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't one of those folks that experimented. I made full, full on commitment mm-hmm. right away. And, uh, yeah, there were some problems associated with that early on. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. what was the drug of choice? Well, uh, and, and also let me interrupt just to say, you know, if at any point you, you don't feel comfortable, with that, you can just say, you know, let's move on to something else. Yeah, yeah. Just, well, you know, I think addiction is an important thing to talk about because it has been such a critical issue in my life, and it's also been you know, the cornerstone of what opened up into the spiritual world for me. And we can talk about that a little later on. Uh, In that I had a pretty virulent addiction. And it was, uh, uh, it wasn't one of these, uh, let's do a little this and party a little bit. That was a pretty, pretty virulent form of addiction. And uh, uh, so drug of choice was more as much as I could do, as often as I could do every day, basically, until I stopped. And uh, so I got clean when I was 24 years old. Really? Yeah, uh, I got. I've been. Uh, I'm in long-term recovery, and what that means is since March 9, 1983, I haven't used any alcohol or any other mood-altering drugs. That's over 32 years. Wow. Yeah, that's so. The addiction is sort of the front end of the story, but what happened uh, as a, as I initiated recovery is where it really gets interesting. You know. Okay, before we get there, how long did it go on? Uh, so about you were 10 years. 10 years, 10, I guess a teenager. Years. Yeah, a teenager, 24 and years it, old. And I mean, it was it was full-on IV drug use from the uh, okay. uh, last five or six years. And uh, it just really uh, yeah. madness, debauchery. You know, I don't think I owned up to anything. But No, the, the point of this is to, to get the healing aspects yeah. across, not the yeah. war stories. Yeah. Which is kind of like, you know, uh, what you experience in... In groups, yeah, twelve-step groups. Mm-hmm. It's about the healing, right? Well, I, I think the important thing about addiction is it took me to a place of surrender. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you know, it took me to uh, an incredible place of fundamental surrender. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, and you know what happened was you know I I'd been taking a lot of drugs for a while and I, I reached a point where I could no longer keep going. I could no longer I couldn't stop either. Yeah, and so it was a forced surrender kind of thing, and um, you know, I said what I know today to be the, the addict's prayer: "God, please help me," with no reservations. And from that point till this point, my life has been a series of miracles that mm. are just astounding. So you speak of surrender and with no reservations, right? So that what does that mean? That meant that um, at the time that I had reached the absolute limit of any ability I had uh, within myself to to make any change that I needed to make, mm-hmm. you know, completely bereft of any hope, you yeah. know. And it was a dark place. And and I think at that point, uh, you know, authentic spiritual experiences seem to have that that quality to them for for many of us. You know, that place of absolute demoralization and degradation and uh, disconnection from the universe. And in that moment, there's ripe, there's an opportunity. Okay. Now, I didn't have a huge experience when I said that prayer, but looking back, it was like the universe began to conspire to help me. 
mm-hmm. in ways that were just one one thing after the other, you know, boom, 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 boom. And it's like there was a, a great turning. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, I think that's important to, to, to mention addiction because it, it really set the stage for that to happen. Yeah. And so when you say with no reservation, that means, what, what does that part mean? That meant that whatever I needed to do, whatever it was required of me, I was willing. Okay. Even with, without a guarantee, without a map, without knowing what that meant. It yeah. was really a surrender into the, a complete mystery because I had no idea that I had no, there was no, nowhere to go except to the unknown. Yeah. And I think that's what that means. For I'll do anything. Whatever it takes. Yeah, whatever it takes. And that's without reservation. That, okay, yeah. And so you were, you were a young man at yeah, this point. 24. Yeah. yeah. And what happened once you were able to start to get clean? Had you gone through like the college thing yet at that point? I, I tried college. I <laughs> uh, did some, commu- uh, did some uh, business college and... Uh, didn't do well. I, <clears throat> not ready. I, pick, I picked up a business degree somewhere in there, some way, but but I don't remember much of it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. So I said things started conspiring. To, it's like the universe began to conspire to help me. Okay, and so I, you know, I, I was the situation was I apparently I lost my job because of my addiction. My boss, who I didn't know it at the time, was in recovery. I had no idea, you know. He went to bat for me for the, to the corporation I worked for, the company, and they continued my health insurance so I could get into good treatment. Okay. Uh, down in Pinehurst, North Carolina, with uh, Ted Clark, who's an old, old addiction psychiatrist. Ted passed away a few years ago, but he's an old addiction psychiatrist from Harvard, smart guy, uh, hmm. really, really loves uh, drug addicts. Uh, so um, I got into the treatment center, and... Uh, <laughs> You know, they were a 12-step oriented treatment center, and everybody there was in recovery, and so it was a really particular kind of environment. Ted ran the place, and uh, he had some really cool people working for him. Looking back, they were a lot cooler than I realized, uh, but they were absolutely, I mean, committed to helping helping addicts. Now, in the treatment center, um, I, I was very ill. I mean, I was not, I was very, very, you know, uh, there's a lot of labels I could put on my condition looking back. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, but it was uh, a very, very difficult place. And, I, um, you know, hallucinations, paranoia, all kinds of really, really disturbed thinking and uh, just uh, lots of that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. And that's just... I mean, it was unrelenting. Mm. In the treatment center, about three weeks in, I was at a 12-step meeting. Okay. And uh, and every day I wanted, I still craved. I mean, every, I just wanted to use. I mean, yeah. you know, and it wasn't a physiological thing. I was, I mean, you know, I don't know. It might have been, but it, you know, I, was, I happened to be shooting cocaine at the end of the thing. So, you know, it doesn't really have a, the same kind of withdrawal as narcotics. Right. Uh, although I, done a lot of narcotics uh, but I was sitting in a 12 step meeting in Aberdeen, North Carolina and a, a gentleman from Fayetteville got up and told his story never forget it never forget it and as he told his story first he, he shared some things that I thought I was the only person I, who'd ever done those things okay. okay. now he was sharing this in a group of a couple hundred people at the, from the podium but more importantly, he, sh- he shared what his interior world was like, what it felt to go through those, what he felt to go through those things, what he experienced in his, his life in, in the throes of his act of addiction. And it was the first time in my entire, I felt like in my entire life that I connected with another person at that level. And the lights came on. I mean, the lights really came on. <laughs> I mean, I was sitting there and this gentleman was talking and I had this experience where the, the room literally lit up with translucent light. <sighs> and three things happened. And three things happened almost simultaneously. The craving to use drugs left me. Hmm. Okay. I knew God was real. Mm-hmm. 
okay? And I knew if I wanted to stay clean and sober, I had to hang out with clean and sober people. out of that meeting and I was, I mean it's like everywhere I looked it was for a while it went on it didn't get happen just for a second it went on for a while this light was shining out of everything mm-hmm. I didn't know what had happened and uh, you know I didn't have the language for it and uh, uh, I, t- I talked to my counselor a little bit about it and I said you know Sue it's uh, it's just like being paranoid only it feels really good <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh huh. <laughs> that was the like closest. The opposite. One. Yeah. It yeah. was. A, it was like a. Yeah. yeah everything it, crashing inward. Things kind of shining outwards, yeah, perhaps. And, or, and yet, uh, and yet, something is watching over me. You know, yeah. the paranoia. They're watching me. They're. You yeah. Know, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they're watching over. Something was watching over me. Uh huh. And it's like uh, a mystical experience. It perhaps? was. It was a full blown mystical experience. It's right. a real deal. Uh-huh. Know, it's still. You know, that happened over thirty two years ago, and when I talk about it, I still feel the aliveness of it. You know, wow. It was not something that. I mean, I've had many other experiences since then, but uh, and I can still tap into the power of that place. That, that radical change. That I don't even know how to explain. I consider it the grace of God, and I think that's part of the the surrender at depth. It's a requirement for that to occur and you know yeah you know so it starts to starts to make sense looking back in the middle i had no idea what was happening at the time i just knew you know things were changing and and the interesting thing was i still had a lot of weird stuff going on in my head a lot of stuff that you know if you talk to psychiatrists today they're going to start looking up which kind of medications to give you right (laughs) you know fortunately i was a little you know, too closed up to, to necessarily talk about a lot of that stuff. I just sort of, you know, I'd got kind of gotten used to it, I guess. I don't know what it was, but, you know, I just didn't talk about it until, until a little later on. And, um, and so coupled with that, we were introduced to the 12 step recovery program. Yeah. And, and then looking back, you know, there was this enormous opening and then everybody got an introduction to the steps as a part of treatment. And so there was a, a daily program to practice too. So it was this big opening coupled with a daily practice, which I think is a key ingredient for long-term recovery from anything. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> daily practice. Daily practice. Yes. Right? And, and and so you know in in the recovery world they talk about sort of the the big opening or the educational variety, and I think what happened for what, that I'm most grateful for is that it was a, a both and kind of situation. Okay. You know, I had the opening, but I also got the daily practice. And my, my counselor, who was, again, this was, you know, this is over 30, this is 32 years ago. She yeah. said, you need to start meditating. And she taught me how to medita- meditate in treatment. Wow. So your head's still buzzing and, you, you know, your brain chemistry perhaps is not at its best still. Your, your body's still on a healing. I'm yeah. having paranoid hallucinations and auditory stuff going on where they put me in a private room that, and I was the only guy that had the private room there. I always had two people at the room because I would wake up every night screaming. Yeah. So that was going on simultaneously with this other process. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, if you see uh-huh. the juxtaposition of these two very, I mean, one of them, it looks like a very severe mental health issue, but there's this other phenomenally powerful evolutionary process happening simultaneously. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So you, and you were tapped in you were able to see something. It, it propelled me into recovery, uh-huh. you know, compelled me into a different life. And, and yet your body and mind together uh, are still, you know, recovering, you know, still healing from the, the fractured state. And yet, she was able to connect with you about meditation as well. So, like, you know, you're not at your best yet, but you could even... Uh, <laughs> That's being kind. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, it's... <laughs> it's I'm still it, waiting to see someone that sick come into the rooms. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I'm sure it, there's a lot of people who, who feel that way, who are suffering, you know, all the time. But, uh, you know, I talked to a lot of people about meditation and, you know, there's this idea, well, you know, I can't start, I can't meditate because my mind's too chattery or my thoughts are racing. And it's like, yeah, that's the whole point is that, you know, you don't, the point of meditation is to help that, you mm-hmm. know, you're not going to start with some kind of quiet mind or anything like that. Right, right. Yeah. And so, so you've got a spiritual, mystical experience. You've got a practical pathway, daily practice, and there's also now a meditative mm-hmm. practice. Mm-hmm. Okay. So a lot's going on here. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And you're at the facility in Pinehurst area. Yeah. I stayed there about six weeks and okay. then came back every week for 13 weeks of, of aftercare. Okay. Yeah, yeah, once a week we drive down from Raleigh to Pinehurst and do the aftercare thing. Mm-hmm. And some growth is happening. Changes are happening. Yeah. Wow, what a blessing, huh? Uh, amazing. <laughs> just amazing. Uh, yeah. And goosebumps just yeah. just imagining this. and So now you're opened up to a new world. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, then what, what, what comes Well, up? you know... Um, so I was very fortunate in that I, you know, I uh, didn't have a job because yeah. they, they kept my insurance, but they, a week after I got a treatment, they let me go. Yeah. And so I could devote all my time to recovery. So I went to a bunch of, you know, a bunch of recovery meetings, meditated every day. Life got kind of cool. It, you know, things started getting stable. I'll tell you this little side story to give you a sense of, of what was going on with me. Sure. So I, if I was riding down the street, and a car passed me, my thought pat my thought process was, Oh, that's a moving roadblock and either the police or somebody from you know, some criminal element was going to pull pull you know uh, run me off the road and shoot and kill me. This was a daily occurrence. I yeah. mean, just in strange uh, just with the most innocuous interactions. Yeah. About eleven months later I walked out to the end of my um sidewalk. And a car rode past me. And guess what happened? Nothing. Mm. It lifted. How do you explain that? (laughs) (laughs) It was like I just was gone. Question is what happened in those eleven months? Yeah, you know, what was going on? What were you doing? Well, I was doing, I was doing the you know, daily practice. I was doing yeah. my, what I'd been instructed. I was uh, submitting to the teaching, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, life got pretty good. And I, you know, uh, you know, I ended up getting some jobs, and my marriage didn't make it through recovery, and so you know, she wanted to keep uh, doing some of the same things, and we parted ways, and uh-huh. uh, so. Um, you know, I, life you know, got me a girlfriend, of course. And uh-huh. So, you know, life was pretty stable. Everything was mostly calm. And and so that takes me into a couple of years of recovery. And I come up here to Asheville for a convention. And I, I meet this guy, and he has a counseling program up here. Okay, What kind of convention? It's a, a 12-step recovery convention. Okay. okay. Yeah, so you're, you're in the 12-step community. Yeah. Working the program every yep. day. Yep. And so... Uh, he had a counseling program at Southwestern Community College, and I was like, "Well, you know, life is stable. Why would you know? Why would I want to uproot myself and move out all the way to Western North Carolina, and you know, where I don't know anybody, and you know, that's like kind of scary, really." Yeah. So uh, I said, "Okay, God." I said one of those prayers. I said, "God, if you want me to move out to Western North Carolina, I need some proof or something. I need it in writing. You know, it's one of those one of those kind of things." So I got home, and literally that same day, I got home and opened my mailbox, and all my Pell Grants and everything had been approved. So, <laughs> you know, right. so I said, uh, that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> so uh-huh. I moved out here to Western North Carolina, and uh, 
and I uh, started working with a dear friend of mine. Uh, he's we've had a uh, you know he was my my professor for a while, and we've become dear friends over the last thirty some years, and uh, uh-huh. uh, learned a lot about therapy and uh, spiritual practice from him. And it was it was fun. I moved up here in nineteen eighty four. Yeah, so, and uh, been up here ever since, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, after that, uh, you know, school, and then I started branching out from the recovery world and, you know, checking out other people that were, I found out this really interesting thing that the recovery movement is not the only group of people that are interested in spiritual practice. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, I know guess, that's radical. I guess that's not a monopoly. <laughs> well, not a monopoly. I right. think it says it somewhere, but so I started going to some different things and experiencing some, you know, different groups and communities. And that was really, it sort of really broadened my uh, uh, reservoir of experience. So very helpful. And, you know, and I always, I always came back around and integrated into that path of surrender, self-examination, yeah. reconciliation, daily practice. Yeah. And service. If I were to sum up 12-step recovery, I just did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And that's common uh, beyond just the twelve step. Absolutely. You yeah. know, these are practices that you know, even if you don't identify as an addict or alcoholic, you know, these are maybe virtues or practices. The universal principles. Universal principles. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. That are necessary to live a spiritual life. Yeah. And, and I think that the, the big, and I think it's important to delineate between spirituality and religion because one can understand these from a sort of theoretical or intellectual view. And then there's the actual practice. Okay. Yeah. And I think that is one of the fundamental, one can have a very powerful religious background and, and not have a practice. And it's just a you know, I believe it's just a set of ideas for most folks that do it, do it that way. But if you engage in an active practice, then it makes whatever that tradition real for, for us in our lives. And I think that's universal, too. And I think it's a difference between, you know, you don't have to be embedded in a, a religious tradition to have the, to practice those principles. Or one can be embedded in a religious tradition and not practice those principles, and so it can get mm-hmm. kind of confusing when you start bringing the world of spirit into the conversation. Uh, and so, yeah. uh, you know, I'm much much more identified with a spiritual life than a quote religious life. You yeah. Know, so. Yeah, and when I think of the term religion, you know, there's a dogma in place, mm-hmm. which has purposes of holding, sure, you know, a, a set of teachings together and and a discipline and, and a practice, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, with diversity of human experience comes different types of that practice. Yeah. And it, it has to have the, uh, those universal principles underneath, mm-hmm. however you're going to do it. And, yeah. Well, I think it also has to have an experiential quality to it. Okay, yeah. And, and so, you know, and, and we talked about sort of the mystical branch of all the religious traditions, or spiritual traditions, if you put folks that have had those experiences together, they're actually going to share a similar language. Yeah. And if you put a group of folks that haven't had that experience together, sometimes there's going to be conflict. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a lot of times there's going to be conflict. Yeah. <laughs> well, this right. is God, and you don't believe in him, you know, uh, something bad's going to happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that could be a, a kind of difference. Yeah, I, I like how you put that. Because when there's that experiential component, you know, there's that sense of commonality. Because what that experiential component is often uh, about, or, you know, a common uh, description of it is the experience of the, uh, the universe all is one. Right. Non-dual reality, non-dual, non-dual awareness. Yeah, we're all part of the same thing here. And, you know, if you practice that and experience it, then, you know, it, it aids in your human relations, but... When there's that sense of dualism, the difference between you and me, and establishing and reinforcing and pushing away, yeah, mm-hmm. that that's where that's where our conflicts come from. Yeah, it changes the playing field. Yeah, okay. gives a lot more space. Uh huh. Reduces yeah. a lot of the tension and conflict. If you have a big enough playing space, there's room for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so. 
mid '80s, you move up here, and you're you are entering a school program here. I went to school. Uh, yeah, I went uh, got some my, my education counseling. Started working at a treatment center. Continued to go to school. Put together a family. You know, pretty. I still had a pretty uh, pretty rigorous a uh, couple hours a day meditation practice. Uh, that went on for many years. Uh, I was introduced to the breathing, the breathwork stuff that we've talked about. Yeah. That opened up a whole, a uh, whole nother dimension to my spiritual life. Okay, it, so for our listeners, the breathwork stuff that we've talked about is holotropic breathwork. Yes, I, I did some other breathwork up in New York uh, that was really powerful, but it just seemed to be missing something. And I was introduced to the holotropic breathwork via Jacqueline Small from Texas. Who was okay. a, a? She was like wrote re, really wrote one of the first books on addiction counseling ever written, mm-hmm. and so she uh, she brought in the holotropic work into the addiction community. Okay, which I think is a, again an interesting marriage of two seemingly diverse groups. Okay, yeah, <laughs> and so uh, I I began to do that in the mid eighties, uh, eighty five I think it was when I started that, uh, and it. Uh, it actually opened up a full blown Kundalini awakening. Yeah. I mean, the real thing, you yeah. know, not a, a few Kriyas or, you know, a little energy running up the spine, you know, but it was a really um, pretty um, uh, powerful opening that, that took about, I guess, seven or eight years to fully integrate. As, as it continued, it was a once that thing opened up, it you know the the Kundalini awakening happened and you know occurred in a breathwork session. Then the, the 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 real challenge with that, or the real task with that, as, as it were, was to continue to allow that to you know to move through without it getting so difficult that it was um, problematic for operating in the world. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, you know, it was a real deal, and uh, um, so forth. I started working with Stan and met Stan Groff, and started learning about his work. And uh, really, really critical for my own. It gave me a a really broad map of how to work with these really extraordinary states of awareness in a way that was systematic, and um, you know, it gave me a language, a method, uh, and uh, was really critical for my own own spiritual growth at that time. Okay. So, so in the 80s here, you, you get introduced to holotropic breath work, and this is like at a workshop, mm-hmm. like a weekend workshop or a week-long conference. Three, three-day workshop. In three-day workshop. Gainesville, Georgia. <laughs> okay. And it starts to catch on after you did a few of these? Well, I'd already been doing some breath work. I've been using a, a, the, another model. I think it's a rebirthing model. Uh, and, okay. Uh, that... that was really interesting, and it has I had some really powerful experiences, but the whole tropic work took it to a whole different level. Okay, and in that first workshop, I I mean, it was like I was ripe, and it just blasted me. I mean, just the energy just started pouring through the body. And this was the very first one you went to. Yeah, Kundalini Why awakening. I, yeah, it really. Okay. I, I literally had to go s- just sit somewhere for a couple of weeks just to get back together enough to get back to my life, you know? Yeah. yeah but, th- but that opened up another very powerful um, spiritual process. Like I, like I said, it took uh, seven or eight years to culminate and, and resolve. Uh, wow. I mean, this is, this is intense, yeah. just even hearing this, you know, as a story, because seven, eight years is a very long time. Yeah. And... This is from one energetic spiritual awakening in one holotropic breathwork weekend. Yeah, and so what I continued to do was meditation. I continued to do a lot more breathwork because the idea with the, with the Kundalini awakening is you don't want to suppress it. You want to keep it moving. Okay. Because if we, if we suppress it, then we get all these symptoms that start to look really bizarre and start you know, mimic a lot of different kinds of 
problematic uh, symptoms. Right. So again, I was in in the world. You know, I'm working. I'm you yeah. know, I'm working as a counselor. I'm finishing up graduate school, all that kind of stuff, and you know. It was this other energetic thing going on simultaneously that was very, very powerful. I mean, it was opening up through the body and expressing in all kinds of visionary experiences. And so the relationship between that very powerful opening with the Kundalini and my daily practice was it, the daily practice helped hold things together to provide containment for the process. Right. The whole tropic community and the recovery community and the work stand did in, in spiritual opening and spiritual emergence provided a framework so that the mind my, my mind had a map to hang on to so as I was negotiating different parts of the process it wasn't foreign alien or even though it's actually felt foreign and alien sometimes yeah. it wasn't it, it was like okay this has been mapped out before so this is this is actually transversing the territory as opposed to just reading about the territory yeah, you're, you're living it, experiencing it. Right. And you've got a community to work with and right. to process it with. Yeah, that should continue. I mean, it opened up, but the, really the important thing was to keep it moving. Yeah. Okay. So day to day, what's it like during this time? Well, it varied. I mean, I mean, you know, there was, uh, my body was generally pretty energized. Um, you know, it was, uh, some, sometimes I would have like these uh, really intense visionary kinds of things and, and, you know, this is simultaneously going over the pretty straightforward, you know, going to work every day kind of life, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, I, it, it got to be kind of playful and interesting. This whole world of consciousness was opening, had opened up. And, um, you know, uh, as the energy moved through my body at different times, I would get like, you know, some of those real physical symptoms of shaking and, you know, sense of opening and, and that kind of thing. And that went on, like I said, for about seven or eight years. And, uh, that's a long time. It went, yeah, well, it was a real deal. I mean, you, most of those things, you know, unfortunately, when people, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, there's pseudo Kundalini awakenings that certainly energize uh, uh, a person's life and can bring a certain kind of opening spiritually. Uh, but the real, real thing, and at least in my experience and what I've been able to discern, is it, it's not a overnight or a couple month kind of process. It okay. generally means it's an opening that takes a long time to, and it takes systematic work as material arises, especially as uh, you know certain kinds of death, rebirth sequences where you know we're we're confronted multiple times with death and what that means, and you know. Uh, Christina Groff opened up a spiritual emergence network primarily to help people in Kundalini awakenings. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, because that was her thing. And it, you know, she studied with Moktananda and, and that whole, that whole tradition. And so she was very familiar with the territory and their work together really helped. So, uh, or helped me and it's helped a ton of other folks, but the, the, the experience is not just a weekend workshop. Oh, I got some I felt some energy running up my spine. I'm having a good lady awake. Woo! <laughs> yeah, right. You might want to edit that out. <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. You might not. But uh, well, know. I think it's it's important to yeah. be able to have some discernment between you know an, an energetic movement and a full on kundalini experience because well with any of it you know we want to be careful right. and we want to be thoughtful and we want it's important to immediately begin to integrate it and to process it and not to suppress it right and and to have an avenue to integrate it you know a, right. a means to work with this this energy yeah um because a lot of what we see in the psychiatric community is you know there can be an energetic awakening i'm not sure if it's on the level of you know a full kundalini experience like you talk about mm -hmm. i haven't had anything personally of that felt like of that level but any energetic sensation that can disrupt our, our patterns and disrupt our system of, of understanding, mm -hmm. you know, can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so there are times when, you know, folks will have a spiritual emergency and it presents to the psychiatric community and that can, depending on how it's received and where it's received, it 
the, the psychiatric community may not have an, an effective avenue to help this person process it in a way that's healthy in the long term. But I think there is an effective, there's a safe way of exploring mm-hmm. it, which involves integration through group work, mm-hmm. individual sessions, like you said, service, mm-hmm. some kind of productive activity, mm-hmm. a meditative practice, and uh, you know, healthy and nurturing relationships, mm-hmm. and good care of the physical body. Mm-hmm. Multi-dimensional approach to health and it has to be a daily practice, and then there can be a gradual tapering and exploring all that comes up in the process and having room to change course along the way. You know, these are the aspects of it that are vital. And then we determine what's going on underneath. And, you know, uh, a lot of times there's a conditioning to the medications, which right. can take time to decondition. Or, you know, some people just do better and prefer to take medications Absolutely. and that's that's part of their system and that's totally fine mm-hmm. i mean i think that's why these medications are out there mm-hmm. and at the same time there's people who have different experiences and are exploring in other ways and i think as long as there's room for acceptance uh, where the individual is uh, things can work out harmoniously yeah so you are going through this period of incredible growth it sounds like mm-hmm. And you're in your 20s at this point? I'm moving into my 30s. And, uh-huh. you know, uh, about um, 1992, I guess, I think it, the, the kind of culmination of the of the awakening ha- uh, started to happen. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I had a master's degree. I had my counseling credential from the, for a substance abuse counseling. I was working in a treatment center. I had a wife and a house and a you know, two point. Well, I had one kid. I was helping raise her other kid and car. What you know, what you look at is, well, you know, this is pretty. I'm kind of, I might even be considered successful or something. You know, or yeah, yeah I met all the standards, I, all the checkoffs. I, you know, my life was really, really amazing actually. And I, I traveled a lot. I was doing a lot of workshops all over the place. And um, I never forget. I was living over in Silva at the time, and I. Uh, I walked out on my back, back porch, and it was a really beautiful, sort of warm spring day, and uh, and I just had that, you know, that I was outside, and it was night, and just this really sense of connecting to the cosmos kind of place. It's, wow. Wow. And I felt this thing in my body, okay, that was not okay. I, I didn't know what it was. I didn't, wasn't sure about what it was. I just said, oh, something's not right in the universe. Mm. And uh, I wasn't, didn't know what it was. I just said, whatever it is, I'm willing. That was about all I said. And I felt this thing snap in my chest, like a broken, it just like, like a, imagine a dry, you know, half inch thick stick just snap right in the middle of my chest is what it felt like. Mm. And I started to cry. Mm. And I cried for nine months. And uh, I opened into, uh, I'd had some pretty intense experiences, uh, but I opened into a place that every day, all day long was just death. That's all, I mean, it was really a tough place, you know. Mm. And uh, I mean, it was, it was a hard place. and. Uh, you know, I remember talking to my friend, one of my friends in California, and I was telling him what was going on. And this is the importance, I think, of authentic relationship and context. You know, I went went, to, went back to see a therapist who was an old Gestalt guy who, I mean, he's an old fucking Gestalt guy, you, you know, really cool guy. We did some good work, you know, really intense work, uh, and he understood spirituality, I think, and, you know, was able to work with me in some ways. But, but I'll never forget what my buddy said. He said, I sort of laid out what was going on. He said, you know, Brack, if we're really on a spiritual path, we'll have to uh, face the seemingly most unlovable parts of ourselves and learn to love those too. And something about that interaction gave me enough context to go fully into the process. And, uh, uh, you know, I just kept surrendering into, well, I'm not going to die today. Now, I'm working as a clinician in a family program. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm seeing a therapist every week, going to meet. I didn't talk for about, I didn't talk in meetings for about 
a year. I just uh, didn't have anything to say. You know, I just was going to sit down in a meeting, just kind of sit there. Right. You know, and uh, and so this really deep process. Just it was. I knew I just had to let it happen. You know, I did some breath work. I did some. I kept doing the drill. And something happened around nine or ten months into it. I remember it, my tears of sadness and loss and grief. And I'm not even sure what I was grieving. Sometimes there was content. Sometimes, but it was like this this deep reservoir of of sadness and gr- just really. I, I heard Young talk, talk about legitimate suffering, and I'm not sure if it that for for some reason that always fit for that particular time. There was some legitimate suffering I had to experience. Part of it felt like mine. Part of it felt like the universe's. Part of it felt huge, you know. Mm. And so I just had to let that through. And uh, I just never forget. I was riding along one day, and the tears of sadness turned to tears of gratitude, and I started coming out of it, whatever it was. Now, if you, you know, I, I told that story in a, a meeting one time, and this guy walked up and said, Oh, I didn't know you suffered such bad clinical depression. And I was like, Fuck, I wasn't clinically depressed. I, right. was, I was going through a, a real significant culmination, I think, of the Kundalini. All the energies in the Kundalini awakening moved and changed so that everything calmed down after mm-hmm. that experience. And I was left with a baseline of I don't even know the word. there's not really words that describe it but a baseline of of this awareness of my connection to the divine and all things at all times it has not changed in almost 20 years I said wow a few times but wow that is an intense description of an epic spiritual experience and a huge state of consciousness perhaps Mm -hmm. just hearing the story sounds immense you're an immense man (laughs) physically but but also this is uh you know this is deep emotional state deep Mm -hmm. spiritual connection powerful emotions deep empathy and how did you how did, how did you go about working through all this? You know, what was what was it like being in the midst of this? Well, it, I think we started alluding to that earlier, or maybe talked about it earlier. You know, one I, I had some maps that were very useful, some maps of the territory. Okay, and these aren't the maps you would you know find in a lot of traditional psychological or psychiatric models. Okay, I also had enough. And it doesn't take a lot of community. It just takes, I think, enough of the right kind of community. Okay. Yes. So I had, um, during this time, I, uh, my sponsor in recovery, who is also very familiar with many of these states, he'd been through some similar stuff. Uh, part of our practice together is in, a, in that kind of relationship would periodically he'd stop off and he asked me four or five questions. When was the last time you ate? When did you have a shower? Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> Let's see, what was the other one? Yeah. Uh, uh, you've been, you're going to meetings, yeah. Okay, that kind of stuff. Would you like to take a walk? Uh-huh. And that was it. Uh-huh. And that was the practice. You know? <laughs> you yeah. Know? And, we, and, and we would generally, you know, I'd answer those questions and, it, you know, and we'd go take a walk and sometimes go get something to eat. I mean, what were your answers typically? Like, how was your eating? How was your uh, I lost. I lost some weight, but I was eating okay. I was... Uh, um, you know, I, I hadn't, you know, regressed or, you know, uh, decompensated to the place, you know, but he asked the questions and, you know, I was clean, eaten, reasonably healthy physically, but it was important he asked the questions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's wise, wise man. And, and what was really important for it was for us to go take a walk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and just 
talk about the daily, you know, he knew I was in it. He knew I was going through a lot of stuff. We didn't actually have to focus on that a lot. We could, yeah, you know, we could, and we could go there if we needed to, but just kind of keep that interpersonal connection. So um, a map, a uh, community. I had a couple other people in the community I could talk to. Uh, you know, daily practice, meditation, you know, uh, reading the literature. And I think probably internally the willingness to just sit and not know. The, the willingness to say, I don't, I don't know where this is going or how it's going to resolve and and just to get okay with that not knowing, you know, uh, I can yeah. do th- I can do this today, okay, and that's all I have to do. I can do it right now. So and you I'll don't sp- get too impatient and restless and want to solve it all at once, and then short circuit your own your own process. Right. This this had the quality that was to going to be no short circuit. It, it, that that actually wouldn't necessarily fit. But it was like okay, the best I can do is sit with this and allow it to continue to emerge you know yeah. do I do all these other things and there's something that that is emerging there's something that's clearing from the body mind and spirit you know there's something that's that's moving and, and my, the most important thing is to allow that to continue on its trajectory you know managing these uh, some of these other things as best I can and and I think what had happened in my experience with uh, doing a lot of breath work and a lot of meditation a lot of other practices um, was a, a a pretty solid innate trust of that process, okay? Yes. So okay. And, and and I had that imparted in some of my relationships, especially if you ever talk to Stan. You know. Yeah. He he he, so, he conveys that in any of his uh, interactions, regardless of what's going on. That you know you can trust that process, and uh, so I, I I knew that from my interactions, and I think there was an innate trust because of a lot of experience in those realms where, you know, I might lie down for a couple of hours to a breathwork experience, have these phenomenal kind of things come up and, you know, they pass and then, you know, go, you know, just go back to my normal life kind of thing. I want to bring the listener's attention to Stan, who you mentioned. This may have been the first time on record that we were talking about him, who is Stanislav Grof, yeah. the eminent psychiatrist and the guy who kind of created holotropic breathwork or you know, used these elements of shamanic breathwork and gave it a formalized system, and which is an integrative system of community and healing. And so when you say trusting that process, you mean not just the process of the breathing, but the process of doing the work every day that is required to withstand this kind of energetic, emotional, and spiritual experience. Yeah, uh, Stan developed the holotropic breathing out of uh, a number of different elements. Okay. okay, yeah. I mean, you have some derivatives of that, the integrative breath work, much later the shamanic breath work. There's a ton of different breath work techniques, and okay. they're all beautiful, okay? Yeah. But the holotropic work was actually developed in 1976 okay. at Esalen. And, um, of course, Stan's renowned for his work with psychedelics. And, uh, right. and so he found at the end of the psychedelic sessions, people were not quite finished, so they would start doing spontaneous breathing and a little bit of body work and it seemed to clear the session make a more uh a really cleaner resolution to the to the psychedelic session so he knew that breathing and body work was kind of important uh it seemed to help even with those really powerful you know you're using a psychedelic drug that's an extraordinary state of awareness that's induced by a chemical you know right so uh he and his wife christina developed a kind of technique which was sort of I, I, n- I never saw this technique because it had already gone past it, but it sounded a lot like Reichian work in a gestalt fashion where you're working one-on-one with someone doing Reichian body work and some breathing in a group. Yeah. Stan hurt his back one day, and they had this big workshop, and so they're like, I can't do the body work. Okay. So, um, and, you know, they use some music and that kind of stuff. So he and Christina said, well, why don't we have everybody partner up and instead of doing so much um, 
body work, we'll have them do the breath work with a partner. If they need body work, we'll see if we can help out. Boom, all the trophic breath. People started doing a lot more breathing. And he said, oh, wow, okay, we just need to do more breathing and see what that does. And so they that's how they originated uh, holotropic breathing, was okay. uh, through a, sort of one of those weird experiences where they went with what, what they had and it really opened things up. And, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it's interesting. There's a ton of beautiful breathwork techniques uh, out there. And I think Gay Hendricks said it best. He said, uh, the, the thing is we need to definitely breathe more. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. But Stan, going back to the original issue, you know, Stan worked with psychedelics for a long time. Right. And, of course, he's worked with spiritual emergency for a long time. And what we're really trusting, when I say trusting the process, is trusting the inner healing dynamic. That part of us uh, that really knows, if we can open to it, knows what we need to do and how we need to get there. And it may not make any sense to anybody except the inner healing mechanism or inner, inner self-healer, the inner healer, whatever you want to call it, okay? Right. Uh, to trust that uh, if we open to that and the enhanced states of awareness, however you get there, activates that innate healing capacity within us. And then there's a trajectory that we really have to let happen. We can't make happen. Mm-hmm. And so when I talk about right. trusting the process, I'm talking about trusting the innate capacity to heal ourselves based on our inner resources. Right. And But, you know, I just want to emphasize as well that uh, it's very important to, you know, be on a grid, uh-huh. a, a, a part of a therapeutic community Absolutely. in that process. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, folks listening to a podcast could be on their own somewhere and think, hey, let's, let's go for it. Let's let it rip. But, you know, uh, what, what makes it safe and what, uh, what gives the facility for that process to go about in a way where you, where you can have a therapeutic experience mm-hmm. with it. Because this, these can be very powerful, Absolutely. extremely powerful experiences, as you were describing. Yeah. Well, I think the thing community does is provide a safe container so we can let go into that inner healer. Yeah, okay. Uh, right. Tom, Thomas Merton said it best, the most dangerous person is a mystic without a confessor. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you can get off in spiritual la-la land if you don't have a community and, and a way to really... Uh, you know, I used to hear about cosmic cowboys and bliss ninnies, you know. <laughs> and they get, or as a friend of mine in Atlanta used to say, they get so spiritually fit, they're no earthly good. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. the community you talk about is, is a critical element. And then the methodology for accessing the uh, enhanced states of awareness uh, is, is critical. And in that enhanced state of awareness, what naturally arises is an inner self helping mechanism, an inner self, an inner healer. Yeah. And that's sort of how it all starts to play out. And then we trust that to guide us through or to what we need to address and then, you know, process it and integrate it through yeah. expression, writing, journaling, meditation, talking, all kinds of different ways. Yeah. And so what have you seen holotropic breath work help? What what have you seen it good for? Wow. Well, I've seen people do all kinds of Let's see how do, how do I answer that cuz that is a really big question. It is a big question. <laughs> uh, and I'm I'm just asking uh from how about the everything? <laughs> You know, it it, it helps with a a ton, you know, uh, a ton of different issues, you know, anxiety, depression, I think addiction and, you know, uh, I think addiction is is critical. I have a working title of this book I'm doing, uh, uh, Looking for God in All the Wrong Places, you know, (laughs) know, uh, uh, which and I think that a lot of what we see that discerns mental health issues from spiritual emergency issues is there is an impulse to the to connect with the divine at the at the core of whatever the mental health issue may be 
Okay. Now that doesn't mean mental health issues aren't real. It just means we, we, you know, we really need to assess and determine what's really going on with our, ourselves or our patients or whoever we're working with. You know? mm-hmm. And so when you look at something like holotropic breath work or mindfulness practices, what's interesting is they work on a, a really wide variety of issues. Mm-hmm. which would suggest, at least to me, that the ideology of those issues are similar. And this is just sort of my, how I frame it up, and right. that the, you know, if we can connect with the divine, that a lot of these problems tend to diminish in, in intensity or, or, or uh, in intensity or they, they just stop being problematic, okay? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, you look at different kinds of depression, for example, uh, where, you know, People don't have a methodology, so they act out on it. You know, it's a horrible, you know, tragic thing for someone to act out on something that needs to be worked out. And so, breath work and other forms of really powerful body centered approaches can help a person go in and and go through those experiences. I think one of the problems we have, in uh, at least I've I've observed and uh, I run into, is that when people start opening up to some of these places, is a therapist really willing to go go as deep as they need to go? And if a therapist hasn't had some of those experiences, or at least is willing to say, I'm not sure what this is and I'm still willing to go with it, it can often interfere with a patient's sense of safety and their willingness to, to go fully into whatever they need to go to. So the thing with the holotropic, I think one of the critical elements of the holotropic work is it's such a big model. Yeah. And so all-encompassing, it allows people to go through almost an infinite, infinite variety of experiences as part of whatever the healing process is without having to set the agenda for them. Yes. Okay. I, I think so. When you ask the question, "What does it work for?" There's a lot of things it works for. You yeah. know, I mean, uh, some some issues are a little bit contraindicated, like bipolar illness. You want to be careful with that because, in addition to the biochemical pieces, it, you know, when a person accesses some of the deep energetic states, it can look and feel a lot like mania, and so they stop. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so you you know you have to have appropriate context and sometimes a, a residential program is better so that they can go fully into those states and get on the other side of it. Right. You know. Right. Uh, you know if, if someone has cardiac compromise or renal compromise or certain other uh, epilepsy or some of that, those are relative contraindications. You just have to approach approach the uh, uh, the person with the understanding that if it gets too intense, just back off and maybe do something a little different or do something else, you know. Right. Uh, pregnancy is another relative contraindication because of the right. vasal constriction and the umbilicus. Right. Uh, but for many of the mental health issues that are fairly common, I think it works really well. Now, it won't, it won't work on the skill level of, of therapy, okay? Yeah. You know, there's, there's, Insight, awareness, evolution. But I tell you, I did a whole bunch of holotropic breath work. I never learned to balance my checkbook until we had electronic ba- uh, checking. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we had to discern, you know, what it is we're doing, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> what kind of therapy we're doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've only been to the one conference Mm -hmm. and I had therapeutic experience personally Mm -hmm. um, and I I benefited professionally from seeing other folks have uh, deep therapeutic experiences, Mm -hmm. uh, folks who are more experienced with it and I benefited from seeing the community and the experienced practitioners leading the conference, uh, the framework that they had set up. There were several breathwork sessions but There was plenty of uh, group discussion time, discussion of spiritual issues, Mm -hmm. giving us time to kind of ask some of the questions which had led us there, Mm -hmm. as well as time to integrate the experience both individually and in further group discussion sessions. And so the whole experience was cohesive Mm -hmm. and it activates that inner healer 
uh, which modern medicine knows little about. It's right. not really geared towards channeling that or enhancing that. Uh, yeah. I think modern medicine uses a different set of measures and standards, yeah. okay? And it's different thing, operating system. Yeah, different operating. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, you know, the thing with spiritual experiences and spiritual awakening is that that, that has to, you, you can't measure it in the same way you do the uh, necessarily the effects of a chemical substance or the weight of, you know, if you take eight ounces of this and eight ounces of that and put it together, you got a pound or something. That's yeah. one metric, or one way of measurement. Then if you, you know, you get data and you interpret and analyze the data, you can come up with what does that mean and what are some, you know, conclusions you can draw from this data, okay? Knowing that these conclusions may be more or less accurate as to what, what the data means, that's a different way of knowing things, okay? Right. The, the thing with spiritual practice and, uh, is that that requires doing the discipline, whatever the discipline is, and then noticing what hap- happens in the subjective world. Now, you can set up me- measurements for seeing how people, uh, you know, like in relapse prevention, all that, does this work, does this... Is this a uh, effective adjunct to treatment or a treatment for addiction? And you can you know, measure some outcomes like that. But the most important measurements are the subjective experience of the person who submits to the discipline, <laughs> which is a very different measurement <laughs> or a very different way of knowing, probably is a better way of saying that. Yeah. And that's also what this whole life thing yeah. involves is our subjective experience. Right. And, you know, that's what this anecdotal evidence podcast is about helping us explore what we can do with it. Some of that gets referred to as the placebo effect sometimes in medicine. Old standard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the placebo effect, in my understanding, is the gold standard. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's a powerful thing. Yeah. yeah. It worked better than placebo. You got something that works. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, hey, and that can be controversial I sometimes, know. you know, but... Uh, what does that really mean? Who's doing the research? <laughs> yeah, I know. It Different did, issue. How many times does it beat placebo or does yeah. it not beat placebo, etc.? So here we've gotten into the world of holotropic breathwork and, and spiritual healing, mm-hmm. spiritual practice. Mm-hmm. And we kind of uh, digressed from, from your personal track, mm-hmm. but you got in this world in the 80s, mm-hmm. and you, you also said you were a substance abuse counselor. Mm-hmm. Mental health and substance abuse. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you also mentioned to me at one point that you were a massage therapist. Yep, and a nurse. And okay. <laughs> a registered nurse, yeah. Wow. All kinds of I'm very curious. Degrees. And I, yeah. I tend to like to get things grounded in the world, you know. Uh-huh. But we talk about integration, you okay. know. Uh, I think the thing that happened after that sort of culmination experience of the of the, the you know, that we t- talked about before the break but, you know, I spent, you know, next few years just really in the world, you know, doing stuff in the world and, you know, and f- finishing up my education or getting some more education and just really being a part of society, you know. Yeah. And so I think when we talk about integration with any of these experiences and processes, whether it's breath work or, you know, some other really powerful uh, technology of transcendence, it's easy to get an experience. So we really need to work with bringing that experience home in the body so that it becomes operational in how we approach life. And that's the challenge for a lot of us. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, to get, uh, not to get so spiritually fit, we're no earthly good. Yeah. And so, and, and even having this, you know, stable sense of, of connectivity for all these years doesn't in any way negate the fact that life goes on and it's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and there's challenges, right. mm-hmm. work challenges, family challenges, all those things. They, they continue. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's any way to bypass those. I think, though, that the value of these kinds of experiences, at least what I've, what, what I've come to, is that they provide a context for everything to operate in. And, the, you know, if we're dealing with infinite context, it takes some of the pressure off, okay? Although pressure is just the shadow side of drive, you know, we're driven to these things, you know. When I mm. say pr- pressure is a projected drive is how I see it, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, so, uh, you know, they just help help lessen the unconscious 
a process that seemed to drive us into doing strange and unusual and unhealthy things. So uh, that's the value of having experiences and integrating them. You know, life becomes a little bit more pleasant and uh, or a lot more pleasant. And just um, you know, works better. You know? <laughs> yeah. Without negating the fact that that life has real challenges for everybody. Period. You know. <laughs> Day in, day out. Day in, day out. Yep. You don't. We, I don't think we get to avoid those by having an authentic spiritual life. I really like how you put that. You know, that's that's we're still going to be in the slings and arrows, as some people have have mm-hmm. described it to me, and we have to do our grounded work and our grounding work, and yet also our full and total spiritual life. Mm-hmm. We're going to have a yearning to address that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's Most ongoing. It just changes over time, you know. Yeah, comes a lot more. At least what I've experienced is a lot more relaxed. You know. <laughs> covering some good ground here Mm -hmm. so all these disciplines going and you're living life riding motorcycles hadn't started riding motorcycles again yet (laughs) i waited till my daughter was grown or Uh 16 and started riding again Uh so you said you had a daughter Uh uh-huh okay and she's grown now she's 20 she's getting ready to turn 25 okay how's she doing she's great she's uh way wiser than i could have ever been at 25 Uh, (laughs) okay yeah and so what's uh what's going on now with your practice and with your work wow um you know i i guess the last couple of years i really well i I need to back up a little bit to answer that question because I'm, i'm really the short answer is i'm still getting grounded back here in Asheville. Yeah. Okay. I spent um, a number of years, you know, working for fairly large companies, traveling around a, a bit, and uh, uh-huh. and so maybe two and a half years ago, you know, I just stopped doing that. It was just very problematic. It was, you know, big business. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it felt like I felt like I had really moved away from myself. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's taken me the last couple of years to get more and more centered and grounded back in myself. And uh, so I still have a lot more questions right now than I have answers to the what you just uh, asked me. I have a practice here in town. You know, I see uh, patients three days a week. Mm-hmm. And I still do a good bit of work with addiction and clinical supervision and, you know, uh, still meditating. And, you know, uh, my life is pretty simple these days. You know, I still, you know, I'm, uh, I, uh, I'm interested. One of the things that continues to come back up is the whole idea of opening up a spiritual emergency center here in Asheville. I think it's a good place to do that, so that some of these things that uh, you know I've learned and some plenty of other people have experienced maybe create a place for folks who are in a spiritual emergency to come and you know approach whatever's going on with them from that perspective. You know. So are there any of these out there already? Um, I'm not aware of any that are operational right now. There may be. Uh, There was a, some have come up and dropped away. And I know uh, Stan's working with the uh, foundation that uh, we we, um, launched in October. Uh, You know, can we create some sort of spiritual emergency center? (laughs) So if you're envisioning that now, Mm -hmm. How would you see that coming together? What what would it look like? Oh, no, that's again a, a nice large question. Uh, I, I think, well, let's imagine it together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The uh, we'll do some dream storming. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think the the big thing is to have a group of committed people who understand what it is we're trying to do, a multidisciplinary team of folks that bring their traditional skill set, training, you know, all the things that go into good healthcare providers uh, who are committed to excellence, 
uh, coming together with the understanding that it's probably much larger than what many of us were trained to handle in our academic programs and you know various you know educational uh, experiences. You know, so uh, putting together a group of people who you have the solid groundedness of being able to operate in this world, and also at least some experience, understanding, and appreciation that there's way more. And some of it is just really just mystery, you know. <laughs> and yes. and to create to create an organization of folks like that, where uh, you know we could have a nice facility and a you know a aesthetically pleasing or satisfying environment, and you know uh, so people could come and do their work, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know figure a way to make it cost effective and sustainable, and uh, those are two critical real issues that you have to look at. The, the spiritual emergency places I'm aware of, they they um, generally offer really um, good programs, those kinds of things, but they they didn't quite get the economic piece down, and and that you know, sustainability a is a, a re- reality in whatever we do, yeah. and uh, so uh, I think Asheville has a bunch of cool practitioners around, and I think there's probably some folks that that would you know if we uh, put together an organization would uh, would could make that work. Yeah, I also I would like to see a teaching component to that as well. You know, mm-hmm. not just a treatment therapy. Or I, sort of at some point, it's sort of hard to call it treatment and therapy, okay? Uh, because it, they don't quite fit with the model. But you know, uh, especially if we're looking at people that are in a spiritual emergency, we're, we're talking something beyond that. So you know, uh, so if we're working with folks who are in a you know. Uh, uh, evolutionary growth process is that a, a place that maybe we could help train some folks to take it into other places too I mean is there a teaching component that we could put in there that would be beneficial to first first and foremost to the people that are receiving help but also to practitioners who are interested in putting this model into other set and settings and other other places that would really be a lot of fun I think you know as I talk about it, I feel just a like a kind of yes in my body, and and uh, and at the same time, I I uh, I'm not sure all that would go into doing that. I have some questions about it, and I, yeah, and I probably have some more work to do around that within myself, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I appreciate you sharing the vision because uh, as you're talking about it, you know, I can envision a multidisciplinary facility uh-huh. in a natural setting. It's affordable, with an opportunity for folks to contribute to the well-being of the community they're involved in, mm-hmm. and to have some time to, to do some of that deeper spiritual work, as well as doing the grounding work every day and taking care of their physical bodies and taking care of their physical and mental health, and uh, being able to process their experiences and share it with a safe group, mm-hmm. and where others can learn this and uh, be able to set up their own centers. And this would be... Great idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it could be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's spiritual emergence and spiritual emergency. And often the difference between the spiritual emergence and the spiritual emergency is how skillfully it's handled by the folks working with the person going through the experience. It, it, you know, it, you know, and sometimes they just get really big and powerful and you need to, you know, we need to go somewhere and, lay on the ground for you know, a couple of weeks or do whatever we need to do, you know, just sort of pull back from the world for a little while and, and go on through what we need to go through. But oftentimes um, in the, at the practice level, you know, if a person is having these kinds of experiences and the, uh, their, their, their uh, helper is skillful enough, they can, can help work to negotiate the difficult times and integrate those as well without it going all the way into a spiritual emergency. Yes. Uh, one of the things that happens with a spiritual emergency is that either the process becomes so powerful uh, that, well, I think that one of the big things that happens, the process becomes so powerful, is that there's not a context or a way to contain it in day-to-day life. Okay. Now, if that's a, if it's just because of the process, of course, you would wanna, we would want a nice, uh, safe center for somebody to go to if it's because of the community then the you know could someone handle that more on like a quote outpatient basis kind of thing 
So those are some real things to think about, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, then you then you start looking at a continuum, you know, <laughs> you know, a continuum of care for people engaged in spiritual practice. You know, a place to come and kind of get support, or maybe a place where people can spend the day, and you know, even a residential facility. Right. Uh, you know, and I think having those kinds of things available, you know, would work in a, a town like Asheville. Yeah. You know. I think this would be a great place for it. There's a lot of interest in this kind of work here. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are drawn to it for mm -hmm. these reasons. So I'm glad we took some time to to have this vision out loud here yeah. on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Any other thoughts? I'm really grateful you invited me to, to have this conversation. I really had no idea where it was going to go, and it's just, I just want to say thank you. It's been uh, uh, great fun. You know? Well, good. <laughs> Interesting it, kind of way. I was like, wow, that's, that's different than what I thought it would be, and, and at the same time, very, very satisfying in some ways. Good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. That's that was the hope, mm -hmm. and that is the hope. And just the same, I'm very glad that you came over and shared a portion of your story mm -hmm. with me and with our listeners here. Mm -hmm. uh, I found it very interesting, and I think there's a lot of uh, material that we covered that uh, is inspiring for future work here. Mm -hmm. So thanks for coming out. The day has uh, grown sunnier as we've been talking. Did you see the double rainbows yesterday? Yes, that was incredible. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was so incredible. Yeah, yeah it was crazy. I, I was walking yesterday and I said, oh, there's a beautiful rainbow. And I took a picture of it. Okay? Yeah. I literally turned a corner and walked about 100 feet and it had well, it turned to two rainbows. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And I was struck. I mean, literally a hundred feet made the difference between a beautiful rainbow and two beautiful rainbows. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, what an experience. Oh. That was just beautiful. Yeah, yeah. special. Uh -huh. Well, Brack, thank you so much for coming over and, and sharing all this. Yeah. How it's do like, you feel? I feel great. I feel, like I said, my, my heart feels open. I feel nice and spacious and really, really lots of gratitude. Great. Well, thank you, and uh, good talking with you, and enjoy your weekend. Okay, you too. Thanks. Well, there it is, my conversation with Brack Jeffries. Lovely human being. Really enjoyed talking to him. Enjoyed our dream storming session as well, talking about a center for spiritual emergency. Starts with a vision, right? So thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. More to come. Plenty more exciting guests ahead. Thanks for tuning in. It's Daniel Johnson, MD. Take care. <laughs>